Hey again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this afternoon. My name is Laura Clito. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the United Nations University Merit, and I'm um, convening a seminar series on behalf of UNU and Masters University in the Netherlands. This seminar today is co-organized with the Research Network on Ukrainian Migration, which is a fairly new initiative from the University of Warsaw, the European University Institute, Masters University, and UNU Merit, which aims to bring together researchers who work on migration and mobility from and within Ukraine. Um, to cooperate in new research and information dissemination and on the organization of seminars like this one. Um, so before I'll introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's some housekeeping that I need to do. So um, our speaker's talk will last um, for approximately 30 to 40 minutes today, after which we'll have time for questions and comments from the your side. So I'd like you to keep your questions until after um, Dr. Schneeger is done. Uh, with her presentation, um, and you can then either put your questions in the chat, so I will make sure to read them out loud for you, or you can use your, the raise hand um, function in Zoom, um, and I will then allocate turns. You can then open up your camera um, and ask the question yourself. Um, please be aware, as I said, that we are recording the seminar today and for distribution on our YouTube channel later on. Please also visit our YouTube channel um, to find recordings of previous migration seminars. So now let me introduce uh, you, our speaker for today. Uh, we are really, really happy um, to welcome um, Dr. Olina um, Schnieger, um, who is currently a Jean Monnet Fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence. But before joining EUI, she worked actually at a variety of institutes, like the Ukrainian Institute for National Remembrance, the Institute for Strategic Studies, and the Ukrainian Department of Foreign Policy. So her fields of expertise compromise um, Russian foreign policy, Russia's policy of historical memory, Ukrainian foreign policy, European security studies, and uh, the Black Sea region very widely. But today she'll, she'll share some insights uh, from her work that relates to migration and deportation, both from an historical but also a contemporary perspective. And I personally think that there is really a great deal to learn for social scientists who are often very much focused on understanding the contemporary world, um, but we need to keep the more historical approaches to things like foreign policy, migration, and geopolitics always in mind for us to understand the contemporary. So I'm really too happy um, to have Olina with us today um, to illuminate what we can learn from Russia's narrative on the deportation of Crimean Tartars in 1944 for our understanding of the situation uh, in Crimea and Ukraine, Ukraine at large today. Thanks again very much for joining us. Um, the floor is yours. I'll make sure to give you a, a heads up when you have 10 minutes left. Uh, thank you, Laura, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today with you, and um, I'll start right now. Um, so, uh, Russian narration of the partition of Crimean Tatars in 44. Uh, my current uh, position in EUI, um, at my current position in, e in EUI, I make research on Russian narratives. And um, uh, actually, I'm uh, I'm not dealing with migration, but here it's a it's a it's a cross point topic, where a force of enforced migration of a entire of the entire people um, becomes um, influences the contemporary situation and uh, the narration about it becomes a powerful tool of. Um, uh, historical policy and of uh, policy in general of the Russian Federation. So uh, I would prefer to, um, yeah, I used, I used in my, in my, in, in this topic, I used um, concepts of uh, narratives of uh, Joseph Nye and also, also uh, the further concept of strategic narratives of uh, Laughlin, Miskimon and uh, uh, Rizel. And uh, here I, um, I approach to the narratives and I uh, look at the narratives, at the coercive power. Um, the power um, where um, the coercive power in a behavioral sense that is directed uh, uh, on, uh, on certain group of people and in this uh, specific topic is directed on Crimean Tatars and other Russian citizens. As well, the narrative here is a soft power instrument directed at foreign audience to shape the way of understanding Russian policy on Crimean direction. 
um, Russian narratives of uh, deportation of Crimean Tatars and Russian narratives about Crimean Tatars in general is a part of a bigger Russian narrative about Crimea, but I will come back to it at the end of my presentation and we can further talk about it if you have questions. So uh, I will start from uh, my first, uh, yeah, my first slide is, has contained some pictures from that time. So I will start from the historical fact of deportation of Crimean Tatars because there was this historical fact. It happened during three days in uh, 1944 and it was enforced migration that what we know about it basically. Uh, we also have archive documents which you can uh, see here. Uh, those who can read in Russian and uh, uh, yeah, if you go uh, through this hyperlink, you're exposed some uh, archive documents of uh, uh, Soviet government, example like this order. And, uh, and this is the main document, I will come back to it. It's the statement about Crimean Tatars, which was uh, the direct order for deportation and which contains the main narrative about this deportation. So coming back to... Uh, how to come back? Yeah, it's here. So... Um, Coming back to this slide, uh, I will just say a few words about it very briefly. So the predation of large group of people oh, during Soviet period was uh, regular or normal practice of Stalin re Stalin's repressions. These deportations happened before, during, and after the World War II. Historians actually do not know uh, when Stalin decided to evict Crimean Tatars from Crimea, uh, but he definitely used the moment of expulsion of uh, German Nazis from Crimea as a comfortable moment for this deportation. There were a few formal preparatory steps, and on May 11th of uh, 1944, a completely secret resolution of the State Defense Committee number 5859 SS about the Crimean Tatars was adopted. It is available here at that slide which I showed you. I will give you all links uh, for those who are interested. The deportation of Crimean Tatars started at 3 a.m. in the night on May 18th and it ended actually in two days at May 20. Uh, Crimean Tatars were given 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes, to get to gather things. Uh, they were allowed formally to pick up uh, 500 kilograms of personal stuff, but of course, during 40, 30 minutes, you cannot pick up anything uh, during the night. And during two days, they have been being gathered, uh, taken by tracks to railway stations, and from there, they were sent in echelons like this one, you can see it here, to the east, to Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan mainly. So uh, the total number of Crimean Tatars expelled from Crimea was about 200,000 people. The last echelon of deportees arrived to Uzbekistan on June 8th. The deportation itself had catastrophic consequences for Crimean Tatars. During the first year, more than uh, three, more than 30,000 Crimean Tatars died of hunger, diseases, and exhaustion. Here is um, some diagram um, of, uh, of those who were deported, uh, because it's also worth to say that um, even those Crimean Tatars soldiers that were demobilized from the Soviet army also were sent to um, East and were not allowed to come back to Crimea. And it, uh, it, uh, it included also those um, uh, heroes of Soviet Union, uh, which were um, 
which got medals and were uh, awarded and honored as uh, heroes um, of, of the Red Army, which fought against Nazis. They were also deported from Crimea and were not let uh, come back. Uh, among other developments uh, which happened like after the deportation of Crimean Tatars from Crimea, I would briefly stop on the toponymic repression. So when Tatars were expelled, were sent from Crimea, Crimea actually was um, empty because many, many settlements stayed empty afterwards. So after that, uh, Soviet uh, uh, authorities, they invited people from Russian territories and from Ukrainian territories to come and to live in Crimea, but at the same time, there was a so-called toponymic repression that was carried out on peninsula. Two Soviet decrees from 45 and 48 renamed almost all the settlements which names were in Crim of Crimean Tatar origin more than 80% of the total numbers of settlements of Crimea. Soviet authorities actually did everything to ensure that the Crimean uh, Tatar's heritage was erased from public memory of Crimea. Only six cities preserved the old Crimean Tatar's names. Uh, and here are also uh, two hyperlinks, uh, two maps <clears throat> you can compare. This is the map of uh, uh, Crimea from Library of Congress. And if we open it, and it's in English, so it's, you can see it. And if I even make it closer, so you can you can see that many cities, all cities, they are like of Tatar origin. They have Turkic names, so it's it's easily recognizable. And if we go uh, here. It's a link, it's an old map, but here is a link to Google map because it's the same map actually. And if we make it closer, then you can see that the names are different. They are not of Turkic origin, they're they are Slavic names. Um, okay. Among, uh, according to historians, Soviet authorities destroyed also Crimean Tatar's monuments, burned manuscripts and books, and mosques were transformed as churches on the territory of uh, other Soviet Union territories, but still most mosques were transformed into cinemas and shops. Let's go further. So, official narrative. What we have about official official narrative is um, was the justification for the deportation, and it's it's direct quotation from the degree of so, of Soviet of State Committee actually not sovereign here is a mistake State Committee of Defense of of the Soviet Socialistic Republic about Crimean Tatars, so you can read it. Um, because this is the basis, actually, this is the fundamental thing on which the rest is uh, has been developed. So justification for the deportation was clearly noted in this decree. And the official reason for the forced resettlements was the accusation of the entire Crimean Tatar people of treason, mass extermination of Soviet people and collaborationism, cooperation with the Nazi occupiers. According to a number of historians, the real reason was that the USSR, Stalin namely, was planning to continue its military invasion in Europe and seize party of Turkey to establish control over the Black Sea Straits. Uh, for this, the Crimea and the Caucasus were cleared the, from the Turks, Turkic-speaking nations. Uh, they were selectively evicted from the Caucasus and Crimea and sent to the uh, to east to the Central Asia. The accusation of treason against Crimean Tatars, <clears throat> sorry, was cancelled only in 1967. In 1974, the ban to return to Crimea was lifted for all deported nations, not only Crimean Tatars, but as well Greeks, Armenians, Bulgarians, Germans, and Crimean Tatars. 
Still, the informal ban existed till the last moment, till the 1989. After the 1989, over next the next four years, about uh, 250,000 Crimean Tatars returned to Crimea just during four years. So the whole nations just stood up and came back to their homes. Of course, when they came back, they find out, found out that there are other people living in their houses and on their land. But uh, fortunately, um, there were no big conflicts. So it's, it's, we were lucky with that, actually. So uh, going further, and here are here are actually fakes. So um, some bunch of fakes, the most popular, which were developed on the, around that official narrative. Uh, while you are reading this, uh, I will say a few words about the backstage, yeah, backside of this. So the official narrative, though formally cancelled, it was cancelled actually formally in 19. 67 already and later in all uh, these rehabilitation acts it was also cancelled it hasn't disappeared it stayed there and there were it, after the collapse of soviet union there were attempts of independent historical historical researchers to restore historical memory and historical justice for crimean tatars but already in two in uh, 2009, with the submission of the memory law, I, I'm talking now about Russia, I'm not talking about Ukraine, because we, we went, these two countries went different directions totally. So from 2009, in Russia was submitted memory law. Uh, it's actually Article 350, 354 of the Criminal Code of Russian Federation now. It was adopted in 2014, but already from 2009, um, the law established four distinct crimes. First one, denial of facts established by the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Second, approval of crimes established by the said judgment. Third, dissemination of knowingly false information about the activities of the USSR during the World War II. And the fourth, dissemination of manifestly disrespectful information about the dates of military glory and memorable days of Russia relating to the defense of the homeland, as well as the dis desecration of symbols of Russian military glory. So from this case, anything actually what you what one can say or will, would say about like alternative version of uh, Russian story or Soviet story about the Second World War uh, could be qualified as a military crime. And uh, from that moment, uh, the, all attempts of uh, restoring um, uh, truth and restoring historical memory of Crimean Tatars was hushed up. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, uh, if you if you if one was sentenced uh, to uh, due to this uh, law, um, he could be sent to prison for five years. So it's not just like that. Um, why it all happened? So um, Levada Center, the um, so the the further developments. Levada Center, the um, the one of the biggest and most reliable sociological company in Russia, which is still functioning, uh, notices change of per perception of Stalin by ordinary Russians. From 2009, the number of those who are ready to recognize him, Stalin, as a criminal has been constantly decreasing. So it's all connected. Uh, sociologists assume that this is strongly connected to the official policy of historical um, memory, which was directed on utilizing the great history, the great victory day uh, for increasing people's support for the state power. Uh, results from polls in the focus groups gave um, or showed the next logical chain. So the logical chain was like we won the Second World War 
under Stalin's command. That means that he was right in his policy. That means that it doesn't matter how terrible it was, his policy, and that means that he appeared to be right because it was impossible to do another way at that time. So if, if one then uh, say that probably it was a crime to evict the whole nation and it was a genocidal policy, to evict the whole nation, send it somewhere to the steppes where they have nothing, no sources for survival, then maybe it's, it, can be, it could be qualified as a crime. So people uh, were afraid to, um, uh, to, to spread the alternative or to make alternative researchers. And now we go to, we come back to these narratives and fakes. So uh, fakes which have been spreading are about allegedly available eyewitness accounts of, for example, how the Crimean Tatars convinced Russian soldiers to leave their combat position, promising to hide them in the villages, as well as belonging to the so-called Crimean Tatars volunteer formations. Moreover, in a number of cases, the retreating Soviet troops faced avert aggression from the Tatar population, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, what is the most uh, fantastic to me was that the last one, that the Crimean Tatars should be grateful to Joseph Stalin because he literally saved the Tatars from complete annihilation, after which they were able to return to Crimea in 1989. And this complete annihilation uh, could have happened due to the hatred from the other people on Crimea and due to this due to this treason. So it was, uh, but um, but what is what I have to say here, and what is important to say here that this fakes that that after the eviction of Crimean Tatars and the deportation of Crimean Tatars from from Crimea, they literally disappeared because. Um, uh, I, uh, I interviewed a few people um, uh, who used to live in Crimea before the annexation, who, who, whose families uh, lived in Crimea after the Second World War, and they said that uh, they, as, a, as children they do not remember Crimea Tatars around them. So in Crimea before 89, there were no Crimean Tatars. But there were still fakes spread from people to people, like rumors about Crimean Tatars. And if, like, I found one case when one man told me that, yeah, there was a person working with my mother, and everyone knew that he was a Crimean Tatar, but he named himself Uzbek man. So he denied that he was from Crimean Tatar origin. So that was the situation, basically, even from even when uh, when the accusation was already lifted. So after 70, uh, 67. OK, let's go further. Yeah, here I would I would briefly uh, go very fast, go through these slides, how fakes, uh, visual fakes also were constructed. So here is it's in Russian, but you can you can read it in English. I, I made a translation. So you maybe, you know, this is a very famous, very popular uh, Crimean Tatar singer with her with her song, which uh, won at Eurovision context contest and it's about 1944 so it's about the deportation actually the song is about deportation but here uh here is written like uh, and it's it's me meaning of this this she's singing not about the deportation but about the year of formation of of the regiment yeah and this this uh, picture also was found uh, in somewhere in internet. If you actually uh, Google uh, like uh, Crimean Tatars collaborationism, you will find hundreds of such pictures. So it's it's not new. Uh, and here is written that second from the left is her, her grandfather, which was sent by Stalin to Kyrgyzia, and but it's complete fake. So both pictures are fakes. But that's how it works. It works in social media on a very low level. And it's uh, like debunking. Yeah, of course, these facts are created, and then there is debunking, but it's like you are um, constantly fighting with the windmills because it doesn't matter how much you facts you debunk, they are in the internet, and people use them in a social media like Facebook. 
So here is a picture again about accusation about Crimean Tatars. And this is a picture not about Crimean Tatars. This is a picture about Bosnian Muslim regiment. Here is this, uh, like, uh, even the number of this picture, which is now uh, in the Bundes Archiv. Okay, so official coming, com going further. Yeah? So official narrative today. During the Soviet uh, era, the subject of the protection of the Crimean Tatars was hushed up. And literally, it was hushed up. There was nothing in, in, in the school books and the education, actual school education, is the basis for uh, formation of uh, collective knowledge of the society about itself. So we, we learn who, what, what about our history and about our neighbors and about society. So uh, people in Soviet Union, they just didn't know anything about Crimean Tatars. Uh, people learned about this historical event actually from the Crimean Tatars themselves when they came back. And thanks to the activity, political actions of the Crimean Tatars, statesmen of Crimean Tatars dissidents, represent, representatives of Crimean Tatars people, uh, attracted attention. The return of Crimean Tatars to the Crimea became a surprise and awakened interest in studying this page of history. So the period of restoration of the historical memory of Crimean Tatars began with the return of the Crimean Tatars to Crimea and with the application for political agency in the following years. Uh, this is the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union when Ukraine and Russia each began to form and implement their own policy of historical memory. Historical um, memory of the Crimean Tatars contradicted and conflicted Russian historical narratives and Russian political plans. And despite the fact that uh, formerly Russia, Moscow, recognized the Crimea as belonging to Ukraine, Russia didn't abandon its plans for the annexation of the peninsula. And the historical narrative about the Russian right to own Crimea legitimized Russia's claims and political actions regarding the separation of Crimea from Ukraine. And of course, Russia uh, was not going to recognize the rights of the Crimean Tatars to Crimea as their homeland. Another factor that shaped the Russian narrative about the deportation of Crimean Tatars um, is the tendency to destroy the memory of the crimes of the Stalinist regime and glorify Stalin itself. Under this condition, deportation is interpreted not in, as a crime, but as a forced policy, which also it had some negative consequences, was generally justified and had a pos positive result. Therefore, the official rhetoric uh, was as discreet as possible. So um, here are some, yeah, I would start from this slide. And here is this quotation from the book, uh, uh, school book. Actually, it's school book, grade 11, but it's deep level. So it means that these uh, children uh, who study history on this level, they can, uh, they can uh, enter the historical departments in the universities and they can study history deeply. So here is the only one quotation from this book which uh, consists um, information about the deportation uh, of Crimean Tatars and other nations from, from uh, in the Soviet Union, not only from Crimea. And this is very brief, though I would say that here is very significant and very important note. And uh, the last sentence, the deportation of named people uh, caused significant damage to their national identity. And it is 2012. If we go further, it's already 2015. And uh, this is the official, actually, I was trying to find any official narrative, like fixed official narrative in books. There is nothing in books, in textbooks. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, this is the only one, and this is a pretty, uh, like distinguished because it's it's the whole project, the whole um, the, the exhibition Crimea and the history of Russia, 
which can be taken as an official Russian narrative because it is recommended by the Russian Historical Society, which is the only one institution in Russia that can uh, form um, historical memory policy. So it's the exhibition uh, of archives. And here is the whole, like the whole part about the tragedy of Crimean people, deportation of, uh, of uh, Crimean Tatars, Armenians, Bulgarians, and Greek in '44. And here is the quotation, which, which if you read it, you can see that yes, uh, it's like totally, uh, totally in frames of official Russian narrative. Like it was a bad thing, but still it was necessary. Um, uh, and uh, the documentary materials named, like which named the reason, uh, are such and such. Yeah. So no, no, um, um, like um, you cannot, you you do not read from here why it happened, or what were consequences for Crimean Tatars. Uh, that it was not it, that it was wrong actually that it was a crime against the whole nation. You just read very neutral and very um, very I would say dry we say dry in Ukrainian um, note about the deportation uh, the, the fact of deportation. Uh, okay uh, yeah but what is what we go further and. Uh, and here is uh, the, the moment when official, uh, I, I named it, yeah, we go further. And here is the moment when official narrative combines or observe, observes with the fakes. And it's very interesting moment because before it wasn't like the, the official Russian rhetoric is really tries to, to be as, as uh, dry and neutral as possible. But here was, is a book of uh, 2019, uh, the book for 10th grade of secondary schools, for Crimean secondary schools. And this book, it consisted, because right now it was like, uh, they say that it was taken out from schools and children do not read it, but when it was printed, uh, it consisted the, the, um, the next statement that part of Crimean Tatars met the Germans occupiers with flowers and wine. Uh, the representatives of Crimean Tatars people were more actively involved in collaborationist activities compared to other ethnic groups in Crimea and Crimean Tatars in places of eviction were given free food household plots and loans for housing constructions. This is actually the, uh, the, the like the evidence of combination be between um, official line uh, and fake narratives. And but this this we can assume from from this information from this textbook, we, we can assume that um, uh, official Russian policy of historical memory intended to include the fakes into uh, its official narrative, to combine and to use the fakes. Uh, Only now you have 10 minutes left, approximately. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my final uh, slides already. So, uh, why, uh, why this, uh, yeah, this book, by the way, I will just briefly say, it was prepared in the frames of a federal program of history, and it was financed from budget, and it was prepared by 10 scientists from uh, Crimean Tatar, uh, from Crimean State uh, University, Russian State University. So it's not just some history book written by, by a journalist or by um, uh, uh, some ordinary people. So what today, what do we have today? How it, um, how, what implications it, uh, what influence it, 
uh, has this narrative has on today's life of Crimean Tatars and on how it is connected with the Russian policy. Uh, so um, yeah, as I said already, I um, hmm, I uh, as I said already, this Crimean Tatars narrative and, and this part of Crimean Tatars narrative, the narrative about deportation, is a part of general Russian narrative about Crimea. And uh, um, my research, uh, my original research, was about a Russian historical memory about Crimea. And uh, I used to, um, Like for my research, I um, I used uh, as a sources more than eighty articles, including twenty four program articles and official documents, and um, in different spheres: in political, and social history, law, social, social, sociology, security, and military sphere. So I used content analysis, uh, interpretation, and comprehensive analysis as a math methodology. And uh, I also approached uh, uh, different web portals directed on debunking fakes, such as Stop Fake and Foreign Napalm, uh, etc. Uh, so, and I definitely can say that, uh, that today, um, that, that Crimean Tatar's narrative is an integral part of the, the whole, uh, the general uh, Russian narrative about Crimea, and uh, that it has these uh, uh, features which are um, mentioned on this slide, and uh, maybe I will, yeah, no, 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 I will stop a step here because I'm a bit messed, sorry. So. Um, Russian Russian sources. These are this. Uh, this is like the um, the collection of the main ideas from Russian sources and Russian uh, uh, scientific sources, scientific articles, scientific books, um, which I mentioned about historical memory. And this is the concentration of of uh, the uh inter-ethnic relations in crimea how russians describe this inter-ethnic relations and crimean Tatars, of course play a significant role because they are indigenous people and they claim to be uh, to have political agency so russians describe always that crimean Tatars were collaborators that they today they're possible source of international terrorism today that Stalin's repression in uh, during the Second World War didn't have ethnic character. Uh, yeah, yeah. That during the periods when Crimea was a part of Ukraine and land, the Ukrainian uh, Soviet Republic and later Ukraine, inter-ethnic contradictions have been growing, and that Ukraine was fueling it. That Ukraine Majlis is a representative uh, institution of Crimean Tatars and international terrorist organization had a common in the spread of terrorism in Crimea after 2000, 2014. Uh, Mejlis is illegal in Crimean Tatar community is not united and that Russian authorities carry out stabilizing policy of the politicization of the ethnic factor in Crimea. So everything was bad and very um, and there was a great conflict potential to Russia has come and uh, and made and stabilized everything yeah oh yeah um why it is so important so it's i will go just very briefly so uh because as i as i mentioned already that um russian historical policy is uh is directed at sacrifice like sacralization of uh, the great victory and the great patriotic war and um this policy brought like the the result of this policy according again to the sociological research researchers and the sociological polls brought to the to the result that uh, like when russians are asked uh, what are the main reasons for pride uh why about what russians are so much proud uh, today then uh, the uh, the answer is that uh, first is the victory of the ussr and the great patriotic war then the annexation of crimea and space exploration and of course pride and so the basis for russian historical 
identity, the Russian identity itself, like Russians, who they are is a pride, a military pride and history. Uh, if uh, why, why it's important, I would also like to know that why it's important that Crimean uh, memory about Crimean Tatar deportation is so much connected to the memory of the Second World War, of a great patriotic war, because uh, here is here are a few examples of uh, the moment when Crimea was occupied and next, and these are posters about the um, like referenda in Crimea, that's that illegal referenda, which which uh, were directed not at Crimean Tatars but at Ukraine, Ukrainians, but still we see that these posters are strongly connected to the um, Second World War, to the great patriotic war symbols. So if Crimean Tatars, which were due to the official narratives, were expelled from Crimea due to their treason, dare to um, violate or to, to uh, protest Russian annexation or to claim more agency in Crimea, immediately these techniques, this uh, rhetoric will, would be, will be used also to them because like, uh, and today it's also very much used by Russian propaganda. If, if uh, everyone who is against Russia today, who is against Russian policy today, has some connection to immediately to the Nazis or to the uh, Nazi heritage uh, or, or something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's an old slide, but I'm yeah because it's ended uh, with March 19. Uh, here is the. Um, it's actually the support. The question was: Do you support Russia's annexation of Crimea? I just wanted to show here the um, stability yeah, of uh, support in Russian society of the annexation of Crimea uh, and how much uh, the Crimean memory and historical memory about Crimea is connected to um, the self-estimation of Russian and Russian pride and Russian identity. The figures, by the way, are the same. So I, I just checked the recent post of Levada Center and the figures from 21 are the same. More than 80% of Russians still still think that it was a good idea okay so some conclusions and then uh if you have questions so uh silence about the protection of crimean tatars was an integral part of russian policy of historical memory and it was and it is connected to sacralization of memory of the great victory and criminalization of this fear of historical memory about the second world war a narrative about the predation of Crimean Tatars was and still is influenced by increasing popularity of Stalin among Russians. So if you if Stalin it becomes popular, then as I said already, you cannot doubt about his actions. Um, narrative about Crimean Tatars in general and about the predation particularly is subordinate to the general Russian Crimean narrative, which is aimed at legitimization of occupation and the legal annexation of Crimea. And the, maybe the most important conclusion for me also here is the main role of narrative about the protection of Crimean Tatars today was and is to deprive Crimean Tatars as the indigenous people of Crimea from its political agency and political ambitions. Ultimately, the Crimean Tatars at the result at the end must dissolve into Russian society and replace their national identity with the identity of Russian citizens. That's actually the plan of, of uh, Moscow and, uh, and, um, and it's a challenge for Crimean Tatars today. Yeah, I would finish here. I'm sorry for some interruptions. Um, if you have uh, questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Alina, I will 